Hi everyone, it's good to be back, albeit with a little change to how our episodes drop. For the past few years, we've been recording throughout the year and releasing that season on a weekly basis. But we realise that sometimes an episode is just too timely to be left gathering dust. So to keep up with new releases, remember to find us on our social media at Two Scientists, or in the case of Twitter at 2SCIS, Two Size. Or you can go to our website, twoscientists.org, to sign up to our mailing list. On the subject of being timely, though, we should probably get on with today's episode with Dr. Karina Rodriguez. So, welcome, friends, to the launch of Season 9 of our Two Scientists podcast. I am Pam Bahia, and you're a scientist at the University of South Florida and your podcast host. With me is my partner in crime and producer, David Basanta Gutierrez. Now, this is going to be a particularly special episode as we're going to be releasing the res- this recording in Spanish as well, with David conquering his fears to step up as host. <laughs> and with this, we'll be launching our partner series, Dos Científicos. Why Spanish? Well, you'll realize as you learn more about today's guest, Dr. Karina Rodriguez. How are you, Karina? Oh, very good. Thank you. This is very exciting for me to be here with you all. I'm glad you joined us today, particularly since it feels like, you know, people are starting to forget about COVID-19 or they don't <laughs> want to think about it anymore. So it feels like, a, you know. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> it's, it's probably good to remind people that this is still a thing and maybe we should be trying to look after ourselves. But before we get on to that, I mean, obviously you've had uh, a varied career. You study many things. Can you t- start by telling us about your studies? What inspired you to go into like a scientific related field of work? Mm, sure, sure. So since really I was a teenager, I uh, was fascinated with the field of pediatrics and uh, I had uh, the privilege of uh, training as a uh, medical doctor at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. And then I did a residency in pediatrics at Hospital uh, de Niño Ricardo Gutierrez, which is actually the first hospital in Latin America to have a pediatric residency. So through medical school and my pediatric residency, I became interested in the study of infections, in particular in the setting of immunocompromised conditions. Why? Maybe because I have most of the childhood infections. So I remember (laughs) mumps and chicken pox and hepatitis A and all that. So it was not fun. Now I have to think back when, you know, actually I saw my last patient with some of these infections. So we have have accomplished quite quite a bit. But getting back on track, I completed several rotations working in different units that were focused on infection complications in children with cancer mm-hmm. and with HIV. And, you know, just to name a few, I work with Dr. Uh, Lopez and Dr. Rivas and Dr. Lita Fascio, uh, and those have contributed uh, a lot actually to my early knowledge in infectious diseases. Then after that, I actually came to the to the U.S. and trained at St. Jude, which is also uh, yeah. uh, pioneer near in pediatric malignancies and uh, and their complications. So at that time, I became involved in bench studies in ID, looking at pneumococci and haemophilus influenzae, and understanding how these bacteria may be, become tolerant to antibiotics and how viral infections actually may open the door and upregulate receptors in uh, our respiratory tract, making res- secondary bacterial infections more likely. Yeah. <laughs> all of those seem very, very topical right now, all of yeah. a sudden, right? Yep, yeah, um, that's true. But just before we started recording, you uh-huh. told us that if you weren't a scientist or a researcher or a physician, rather, there's another career you really would have liked to go into. Yeah, so I love to listen to radio. So actually, I would love to have done this professionally, interview people, but I know that I'm not good at it. <laughs> so that's why I went into medicine. And, and I also love to dance. So actually, I do. I used to do quite a bit of Spanish dances. So do you do the typical Argentinian tango? Uh, not tango, actually. So my parents are from Spain. So I do ah. more flamenco and all that part. So I know how to play castanets. And, you know, so that, that part <laughs> is long back though in the days <laughs> oh really? what a small world what part yeah. of spain uh, so they're from northern spain from galicia <gasps> oh this is going to be very interesting for the spanish version <laughs> you'll find out but okay so going back to your actual medical career you became a physician in argentina but 
like so many immigrants uh, you find when you move to another country you have to retrain so what was that experience like uh yes <laughs> this is certainly a long path so i originally came to the u.s as part of my uh, pediatric training uh, from Argentina. So I have the privilege of rotating at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And then I actually learned from some very astute ID physicians. I trained with the pioneer in rotavirus vaccine with Dr. Offit and also with Dr. Jeffrey Weiser, who is a leader in, in microbiology. So following that experience, I said to complete the U.S. medical exam. So those are tr three, not fun. Yeah. <laughs> and then I applied for a fellowship in pediatric infectious diseases at St. Jude, once I actually completed my residency in Argentina. And after that, I actually have also great mentors at St. Jude with Dr. Tuomanen and Dr. Flynn, and they guide me in lab and clinical research at, at St. Jude. And then I, to complete all the board requirements, then I have to do again a second residency in the state. So that's how I came to the University of South Florida and I did an additional fellowship in HIV. Uh, and after that, <laughs> I was done <laughs> with all the training. And I was offered a position as faculty at USF and then I continue as division chief, which is currently what I am. So I guess for people that want to follow a pathway, you know, abroad, I think it's, it's a lot of work. But certainly I think, you know, if you're passionate and hardworking, there are a lot of opportunities really here to follow your dreams. So I think, you know, I was fortunate to learn from different health systems. I mm -hmm. think that that's that also gives you kind of a different perspective into into medicine but really at the end of the day it's really you know the touching the people uh, that you encounter through your medical career so you know it may have a little bit of a different flavor you know in, in different countries um, and different health system but for those that you know would like to go into the adventure what I would suggest is you know just Make sure that you reach out, you try to understand, you know, what you're getting into. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, just ask for help because uh, usually, you know, there is a, a lot of help along the way, you know, to get to the final line. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, on top of your work as a physician, obviously, mm -hmm. you do research as well. And one of the things that you've mentioned so far is that you do studies on HIV. So can you just give us a kind of brief, brief recap of what HIV actually is and what your work involves? Okay, so really HIV has become an example of a disease that went from literally a death sentence to really a treatable disease with a similar life expectancy that a person uh, not infected with HIV has. So HIV is a retrovirus uh, that is transmitted through blood, sexually or from mother to child. And fortunately, one of the uh, major advances has been really the improvement in, in the prevention of mother to child transmission. So if we think, you know, back in the days when I actually started as a pediatric resident in Argentina, really we have very very limited medications for the mother and actually for the infant if yeah. it was infected so we went from you know approximately 25 or 40 percent of the pregnant women may actually transmit HIV to their infants to really have transmission that is actually less than one percent and you know we, we want actually to get to zero transmission so really there has been you know kind of a, a, a lot uh, of improvement in, in this. I guess in particular what I have done, so I have been involved in uh, several pediatric HIV studies. So in the lab, um, I have I studied the impact of immune reconstitution and immune activation in HIV mm -hmm. uh, using uh, flow cytometry. So for those that are less familiar, uh, what we do is we look at immune cells sustained with different monoclonal antibodies and that can help us to understand the impact of the virus in the immune system. In a way, HIV is an, an inflammatory disease and many of the effects of the illness are linked to the this persistent activation of the ah. immune system. So the virus is tricky in that it evades multiple steps uh, of the immune response and also targets the specific cells that actually help us to combat uh, mm -hmm. infection. And actually that's what the name means, right? Human correct. immunodeficiency virus. Correct, correct. Yeah. So, so very early on what we were actually doing in the lab is we were actually looking at the effect of the thymus, which is a gland that is located in, in the neck mm -hmm. and actually is very active uh, when you're young and then you know kind of involves with with time 
Uh, so we wanted to understand why some children actually were able to reconstitute without necessarily having a good virological control. Now really the target of HIV treatment is really you know, having a very strict viral control. So what we want to do is really suppress the virus as much as possible to decrease that immune activation. And also, you decrease the amount of virus or the reservoir of the virus in, in, in the person. And then you also avoid potential resistance to HIV therapies as well as transmission to, to others. And so one of the hallmark advances has been that a person that, you know, that is infected with HIV but has an optimal control of the virus, which is called you know, viral suppression, does not transmit either to their partner or to the child mm -hmm. uh, in case of a pregnancy, and that is what is known as uh, U equals U, so undetectable means uh, un untransmissible. Oh, okay. And then I have also participated in, in trials in pediatrics to approve some of these drugs, so now we actually have um, some medications that are you know, similar to what is actually used in, in adults. So, you know, just a single pill, which was really unheard at the time that, you know, I started in the HIV field. We have, you know, many, many suspensions. It was, you know, really crazy to really give all these medications to little babies and, and, and children. And now we have some options that are just, you know, either a one tablet or, you know, granules that are dispersed. So, you know, really we have come you know, kind of a long way. And then I have also participated in some studies to prevent HIV. So there is a mm -hmm. lot in, in what is called PrEP or uh, pre-exposure yeah. prophylaxis. And there is really a lot of new developments in the field, not just with oral medications, but with injectable medications, maybe in the future patches, uh, a lot of things actually are, you know, coming in the pipeline and some actually may be able to be used once every six months or so. So it's, it's really yeah. very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually saw in the papers recently, there was a story, hopefully I'm remembering this correctly, but there are some people who seem to be naturally resistant mm -hmm. to the virus, right? So I think there was a stem cell treatment that somebody mm -hmm. received and it actually cured them of the disease. Is yes, right? so there are, there are actually three cases, so two with bone marrow transplantation. And the most recent one was a woman that actually use core blood, receive a core blood mm -hmm. from recipients that are CCR5, have a deletion. So that is kind of a receptor where the virus actually attaches. So if you have a deletion, the virus cannot, you know, go Ooh. in. So the very, very first uh, case was actually in Berlin. So it's called the Berlin patient. Uh -huh. And he actually had uh, to undergo uh, a bone marrow transplantation because of other issues and mm -hmm. happened to be HIV. So they said, well, you know, maybe let's find a resistant bone marrow to transplant this person. And actually, you know, he was cured oh, wow. of HIV. And uh, this woman so far is also, you know, negative of medication. So, uh, you know, some of the research is actually going that way, how we can make. And, you know, some of those that has been, you know, kind of through the observations that some people, even if they have a very high, you know, risk or, or exposure risk, they did not become HIV positive. So that kind of, you know, spearheaded that, that line of investigation. Yeah, that's so exciting. But yes, so the reason why we brought you here today and the reason why we found you actually, because of a completely different virus with which we're all sadly very familiar and we got in touch with you because you are leading a major clinical trial in the vaccine for children and so i think the the test had already been done from 12 years and upwards right and that's been approved but you're looking at the the younger children from five years to what's six the lower months. end six months uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay so can you tell us about how you got involved in that study? Yeah, so actually it's interesting because a lot of HIV researchers were invited to participate in COVID vaccine trials uh, just because the network and, you know, a lot of the research capacities actually were, you know, kind of set up through HIV. So I was originally invited to be a participant of the COVID vaccine prevention network that has been funded through uh, the NIH. So I started with the first uh, phase three here at USF with a, the protein-based vaccine for adults. And then I was invited to participate in the mRNA vaccine 
uh, mm -hmm. from six uh, months to uh, to 12 years. So it really has been, you know, really very exciting and accelerating time for all of us <laughs> on top of the <laughs> COVID vaccine pandemic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, can you tell us, or rather give us an overview of a how a clinical trial is first set up? Like, what do you need to do to get a clinical trial to take place? Yes, so, I mean, there are actually many, many, many steps. So it goes, you know, really from the design to selecting, you know, which are the trained investigators that are actually going to, to do the study. It goes through different, you know, institutional approvals and RB approvals to make sure that, you know, the, the protocol has all the safety net, you know, kind of included within the trial and then to the execution. So it really takes usually quite a bit of time you know from the start to to the the initiation what has happened with you know some of the COVID vaccine trials is that a lot of things instead of going you know one after the other they kind of they move in parallel yeah and that is you know what accelerated some of these that otherwise it takes years and years for a vaccine to become available yeah so actually there were lots of really <coughs> interesting diagrams of uh, what we would call gantt charts uh -huh. of you know, these timelines to say these are things that we did in parallel to save us so much time to develop these incredible vaccines. Mm -hmm. Now, given that you're working uh, with very young children, many people might be wary of signing up for such a study. So how do you ensure a the safety of participants and to get people to participate in the first place. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, I mean, COVID, I think, was, you know, really a very unique situation, I think, you know, because it did, you know, kind of encounter the unknown and, uh, you know, what could happen. And we didn't have any therapeutics or anything like that at the very beginning. So, and kind of the quick development of, of, of things. But really, you know, these trials, I mean, not necessarily just in, in pediatrics, but any clinical trial, they have... You know, you, you have a lot of different things to make sure that their safety is first. So, mm -hmm. for example, from the clinical uh, point of view, we meet with the patients. We see them at any, you know, kind of concerns that they have, either in a medical visit or through telehealth. The patients, for example, for these studies, they complete what is called an e-diary. So they actually go on the phone, they download applications. And uh, in this case, you know, the parents will be actually, you know, taking the temperature of of the, of the child and you know saying you know if the child has x y or z uh, symptoms and we are kind of 24 uh, 365 you know available for yeah. for any uh, for any concerns and then the studies have what is called kind of pause rules so if let's say you know some reaction becomes apparent and you know it happens at different sites so the sponsor gets all these notifications and of course can actually put a hold on the study so put a, put a pause on the study mm -hmm. there is also the smb so there are monitoring boards that are actually are completely independent of you know the pharmaceutical company that is sponsoring the trial uh, that you know, monitor all the safety signals. So they mm -hmm. meet regularly, or if there is any adverse event, they may be serious. And they have, you know, of course, the authority to actually stop the trial. And they also can stop the trial sometimes early on just because of the results, because they see that uh -huh. there is a wonderful response in the patients that, have, you know, are receiving, let's say, the treatment versus the one that are, you know, on the placebo. So it kind of goes both ways. You know, you can be stopped because of bad things or stopped actually because of good things. Yeah. Um, and actually, having said that, one of my colleagues was considering submitting her daughter for the trial, who's eight years old. And, you know, she wanted to make sure her daughter was comfortable. And within the space of the three days she was doing this, the age group was full. So clearly, a lot of parents were very keen to get their kids involved. So another question I want to ask you is about the fact that um, in the past, there wasn't a lot of attention paid to uh, ensuring that participants come from diverse backgrounds. And this is absolutely necessary to make sure that these treatments and vaccines work for as many people as possible, right? So how do you address, address this problem now? Yeah, so I think, you know, usually in, in our patient population, our catchment area, I think USF is actually quite diverse. So mm -hmm. we actually, you know, we usually have a good diverse population that we see for, you know, for clinical care. Um, what, you know, we have done, and of course, you know, HIV has been, you know, 
also another area where, you know, kind of community outreach has been very important to reach out, you know, hard to reach populations. So we have some experience on that area. So for example, for these particular COVID vaccine trials, really there was uh, kind of an allocation of the number of people actually that had to be of any particular race, just uh-huh. to make sure that there was not, you know, 80% of people Caucasians in the study and, you know, there was no Latino or some, yeah. some so so there was actually kind of a cap that we actually have to follow. So from our end, you know, as you said, we did receive actually, you know, it was it was hard because actually we have to say no to many people. I mean, well, we have, you know, I would say, you know, five to ten times, you know, more part you know, oh, people well, actually wanted many. to participate that we could enroll. So, and it, it was really, I think, um, very interesting with the patients. So some patients actually, you know, made T-shirts. So I mean, the, you know, <laughs> this is that your active. We have family <laughs> actually made t-shirts and all actually wear the t-shirt. But so you know, there was a lot of people that were very, very motivated to be yeah. to be part of it. You know, sometimes it doesn't happen. You know, to that degree. But I would say a blessing. And and the kids are so smart. You know, they ask you questions. You know, they were actually coming prepared to have. You know, their swab in the nose and they knew they were going to get blood draws and stuff like that. But it was really a, you know a great experience. That's so cool. So obviously the the thing that we would really like to know is that this study has been taking place for several months. Um, Are you allowed to share with us what preliminary results are or... So, I mean, I can share with you what is published. So the information for 12 and older is available and has been you know, a very efficacious um, vaccine. Right now, actually, they are, we're almost to the completion of the earlier cohorts, so the 6 to 12 years, and the and the other one is still enrolling. Mm-hmm. Um, so it has been actually very, very safe. I, I know that, you know, there has been some concerns about the myocarditis and, you know, some additional provisions actually were done during the trial to actually collect blood to make sure that, you know, those signals were not missed uh, in case that happened. And from what we have received from from the company, there hasn't really been, you know, any any signal on that on that end. So so far again it's very safe and they have excellent, you know, the the adolescents had either a similar or a stronger immune response, which is not, you know, surprising that adults with mm-hmm. this vaccine. Yeah, so I'm going to do the audience questions first. So, understandably, many parents have concerns and reservations about getting their young children vaccinated. And so we have some questions from them too. The first one I have is from my younger sister, Suki, who has two children under the age of 10. And she'd like to know if it's safe to give the vaccine to a child who has food allergies. I know that we had, particularly with Pfizer, I think it was, Mm -hmm. some people had anaphylactic reactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those, I mean, they are reported, are actually very unusual still. So food allergies is not a contraindication to get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just to the specific vaccine products, which is actually pretty unusual. So what I would suggest is, you know, to just discuss with the pediatrician or with the you know primary care provider with the specific vaccines. So all these patients, for example, in the trial, they're monitored for 30 minutes after the injection. We have not had any any issues, you know, locally. Neither you know anything that has been brought to our attention through the, through the trial. But again, they are very 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 unusual. Yeah, and as you said, I think they discovered that from the Pfizer one, it was actually like the fatty layer that went around Correct. the outside, mm-hmm. not the actual component of the vaccine. Correct. Um, so I also have a series of questions from my friend Sam, who is uh, <laughs> really quite concerned. But she said, what are these vaccine risks? So you've mentioned, and obviously this you're sharing this with a caveat that this is from children six to... 12, is that correct? So the, what, is, what has been published is 12 to 18. Uh-huh. To later okay, 18. yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us what has been described? Because I think you're right in saying that it's the myocarditis that people have heard. Mm-hmm. What is the actual incidence of these things? So this is actually extremely rare. So you have a much higher risk of having myocarditis due to the COVID 
COVID-19 virus that actually have to the vaccine. Um, it has been seen and that is slightly more frequent as with myocarditis in general, in usually it's in males and actually within the teenage year to young adults. So uh, those are usually kind of the signals, but they are actually very rare. And nothing actually has have, you know, kind of long-term effects on, on the heart. So for the majority of the patients, you know, they feel better in a couple of days. Some of them actually take some ANSES, like, you know, ibuprofen and stuff like that, and, mm -hmm. uh, and it goes away. And again, you know, we have seen, you know, much more myocarditis because either of COVID-19 or there is another entity that can, uh, I mean, this virus is, is really fascinating. So in, in, in children, uh, you know, we have actually seen not as much with Omicron likely, but with the initial ones, something that is called MIS-C or multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. Mm -hmm. So these patients actually have, you know, sometimes very mild COVID approximately two to six weeks after the COVID infection that sometimes is not even recognized they will come to the hospital really I mean sometimes very very sick and you know sometimes actually they need ICU care uh, with like rushes persistent fevers it's kind of the immune system you know kind of going wild <laughs> after the infection so this kind of inflammatory uh, disorder which is treated in a similar way to another entity that we are familiar as pediatricians that is called Kawasaki disease uh -huh. um, so the vaccine actually has also been effective in decreasing the amount of, you know, people that actually have uh, MISC after, you know, after the vaccine is actually, the, the frequency is actually much lower. So you've basically answered her next question, which is, which is more dangerous to health, getting COVID as a five-year-old or the vaccine risks? Yeah, and, and you know, and I think that the the important part is that we just cannot predict. Typically, you know, there are other comorbidities, so people that are obese, uh, that have hypertension, that have, you know, other kind of immunocompromising conditions, they may be at a higher risk, but, you know, I have seen plenty of children that have no other risk factors and they end up, you know, having uh, to come to the hospital because of complications of COVID. So, you know, I think it's, again, it's milder in children, but it's not out of risk. Yeah, before I forget, can you define what myocarditis is? So myocarditis is kind of an inflammation of um, the myocardium, which is, you know, part of the of the heart. It's usually actually seen not, not just with COVID uh, or not just with vaccination, but actually it's actually very frequent with viral infections and many times you know may be completely you know under recognized so the and the majority of the times you know it just goes away with with time and okay. nothing to do you know and you don't have to do it really anything with it <clears throat> okay so i i guess just hearing a clinical term like that might be making people more afraid than they necessarily should be correct mm -hmm. okay so long term what are likely side effects of the vaccine for children and uh, is it possible that there would be long-term impacts we don't know about yet? I mean, the most common uh, side effects are, you know, kind of the typical from vaccines, so pain at the injection site, sometimes there can be some redness at the injection site, uh, headaches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, kind of muscle pain or, feel, or feeling fatigue, so those are kind of the most common ones. Um, that are reported and usually they go away you know in like 24 to 48 hours some people may have you know kind of a more persistent or delay redness in the at the injection site and usually the most of the vaccine effects happen within you know the very initial time to usually not more than six months or so so that was why you know the trials and the start of the immunization they wanted to have you know at least the two months first and yeah. then you know kind of going to the potential side effects you know later on and this is why it's important to do you know randomized clinical trials because some things can happen just because of, and there can be a coincidence because a lot of people are actually getting the vaccine so that's why you know you can tease out if it's vaccine related or really was you know at the same time just yeah. because of, uh, of chance um, so I cannot say there is not going to be any you know kind of a known effect but it will be very very unusual i mean right now we have have you know millions and millions of people worldwide with these with these vaccines so if there will be you know other unknown signals you know i i think we should have seen it at this by this time yeah because the first people were getting the vaccine how long ago now oh uh now i guess it like almost two years yeah so i mean and 
Do you know off the top of your head whether there's ever been a vaccine which did cause serious side effects that were this far down the line? The majority really have, you know, kind of uh, side effects either right away or within this, you know, two months time mm -hmm. is usually the case like Guillain-Barre, you know, and some other autoimmune diseases that can come up here usually is within, you know, that early time frame. Okay. <clears throat> so before we wrap up, I was wondering if you could tell us, so uh, you're still working on the, the clinical trial for the mm -hmm. younger children, but what is going to be next for you once that's kind of done with do you already have something lined up in terms of a future project so i mean i will you know continue to to work on the covid vaccine we will be um following up with with hiv research and you know not just for hiv treatment but also for hiv prevention so you know those are will be kind of the lines that i will be you know continuing oh very good um i really appreciate your time today i mean this has been super interesting and i think this is going to be a valuable listening experience for a lot of people. So thank you again. All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to, you know, to participate. This has been really great. No, of course. All right. So something embarrassing. Well, I do remember the early time of, of ID research being asked to actually go with another fellow. I was actually studying pneumococci in St. Jude. So one of the one of the projects was actually looking at how, you know, this bacteria went into a mouse, uh, into a, a rabbit model and actually, you know, how quickly the bacteria was killed or if it was actually persistent on the CSF. So I remember going with a, you know, with another fellow. I have not done, you know, animal studies in Argentina, so that was new to me. And so I said, I cannot do that. So I just remember the little rabbit looking at me and it's like, I cannot... <laughs> So I think that that was my, you know, my, I guess my fear to the contribution of science. Luckily, I love, you know, all the other stuff with bacteria, you know, petri dishes, flow cytometry, but no animal models for me. <laughs> You've been listening to Two Scientists, directed, edited and hosted by me, Pampe Bahia, and co-produced with David Basanta Gutierrez. This episode was recorded in the charming little terrace at the Corner Cafe in Tampa and the background track you're listening to right now is called Arti by a band called No. We wanted to give a shout out to Karina's home nation of Argentina and we're grateful that No made their music available through Creative Commons. You can find more of their work on Bandcamp and more of ours at twoscientists.org.
My name is Dr. Karina Rodriguez. I'm professor of pediatrics and division chief of pediatric infectious diseases at the University of South Florida. I'm also vice chair of the um, faculty affairs at, uh, at the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, I'm an investigator for the um, COVID-PN uh, network. Um, and also um, of the Adolescent Trials Network. Um, I don't know what else I said. In there. <laughs> yeah, I think that's enough. So you, you can actually put. Yeah, yeah. yeah just. That's a long string of titles. Okay.